I most heartily welcome uh, Christine Johnson Finn from the Rensselaer um, Polytechnic Institute, Polytechnic Institute in Troy in New York um, to our seminar today. Uh, she did her undergraduate research at Youngstown State University, where she did major in chemistry, but also did minors in mathematics and geology. And the geology interest and promoted her to actually get a LPI internship at NASA Johnson Space Center in 2010. And after her PhD, she then joined the Early Life Science Institute in Tokyo in Japan, where she was quite a little bit of time, and she became fairly recently a tender track assistant professor at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, where she is now. So, Kristin, the floor is yours. It's a long time since we met last time in Iceland, if I'm not mistaken. So, please, go ahead. Many thanks for coming. Hey, thank you very much, Wolf, for that wonderful uh, introduction. So, as Wolf said, the very first time that I actually um, met him was at the Icelandic uh, Astrobiology Winter uh, Summer School in 2015. And it's been wonderful being a part of the European Astrobiology community. So, I'm really excited to give a talk uh, to all of you today. As described in my introduction, so I've been interested in both the fields of chemistry and geology for the entirety of my uh, academic career. So I'm actually quite happy to be at RPI where there's a lot of interdisciplinary research. And so I have joint appointments in the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology, which is my primary appointment, um, and also the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences. Also another component here, and I'll, I'll shamelessly promote the center that I've joined here at RPI uh, the RARE Center, which has focused on astrobiology sort of initiatives, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. So, as Wolf mentioned, I was working at the Earth Life Science Institute until uh, spring of 2022, and when I first arrived in the U.S., I actually uh, hadn't been back to the U.S. in a couple of years because of COVID. And as soon as I arrived off of the plane, I was met by uh, quite a bit of Americana. In fact, this figure referred to as Uncle Sam. Something I hadn't realized when I took the job at RPI was that Uncle Sam, the person that this visage is actually modeled after, um, was originally born in Troy, New York. And if you're not familiar with it as a US mascot, it's often a figure that is uh, enlisted to sort of in, encourage recruitment and involvement of people in different sort of usually uh, military initiatives. So giving a little bit of background about my own research, I have a lot of different interests and it's because of the fundamental nature of the research I pursue, primarily in organic chemistry. Uh, today I'll be talking about my astrobiology components, but it also involves origin of life, looking at icy moons, green chemistry, sustainability, soil science, and more. And it's because I do organic reactions uh, with different kinds of experimental techniques. Here I just outline hydrothermal experiments and electrochemical experiments, which is something that I adopted after uh, spending time in Japan, and also thermodynamic calculations, which was uh, something that I'd learned and started to utilize during my PhD st studies at Arizona State University. Using all three of these techniques together, I end up pursuing organic reactions in a way where I'm trying to track universality of different kinds of functional groups of reactions, specific kinetics of different kinds of organic reactions, and the mechanisms of organic reactions on mineral surfaces. So first I want to start with a general idea of what is astrobiology. And the reason why I start with that question today is because I see quite frequently an emphasis on the biology part of it. And as I've already mentioned, I work a lot in chemistry and geology. Now, astrobiology as it is defined by the Oxford Dictionary is not quite correct. 
They describe it as the branch of biology that is concerned with the study of life on earth and in space. Now, I've been in the uh, field of astrobiology now since I started graduate school. So that's about 13 years. And that's not been my experience. Instead, I found that the University of Washington has a much better uh, definition of astrobiology here. And that's that astrobiology itself is a study of life in the universe. And to facilitate that sort of understanding requires a combination of knowledge and techniques from many different fields. That can include ast astronomy, biology, chemistry and geology where I reside, atmospheric science, oceanography, aeronautical engineering, so on and so on. So it's an incredibly interdisciplinary field that is of course concerned with biology, but doesn't necessarily only pursue biology as the major be all end all. But one could be forgiven for thinking that biology is the large takeaway word from the word astrobiology. In fact, we are inundated with biology around us at all times. This is just a couple images of uh, you know, some beautiful gardening that uh, is outside of my office at RPI. And then there's also plants that have invaded my office inside uh, the building at RPI. And I'm not even talking about students yet. And so I see biology every day, as I'm sure all of you. And that's because Earth, as we see on the left here, is an object that has a lot of greenery. It has a lot of life going on. And it's part of everything that we do every single day. In fact, biology is present even in many different kinds of extreme environments. Here I'm talking about hydrothermal vents, depicted a couple of different ways. These images specifically uh, taken from National Geographic, which had um, a really a great cornucopia of different images and uh, image credits. And hydrothermal vents are by their nature quite hot, uh, dealing with different kinds of gradients, and you see here that there's a hydrothermal vent community. We're not talking about just one organism can survive here. An array of different organisms exist, including uh, their own ecology. So here at the Black Smoker, Black Smoker you've got Pompeii worms, uh, bacterial mats, barnacles, octopi, fish, bacteria, crabs, list goes on. And this is life that is thriving without sunlight. It doesn't need sunlight to exist, unlike the plants that I've depicted before. But still relatively early days in the exploration of environments such as hydrothermal vents. In fact, the very first hydrothermal vent was found off of the uh, coast of the Galapagos Islands in 1979, but it was detected before that in 1977 by heat signature. Here I show a global distribution of hydrothermal vent fields. Now what you'll notice uh, for these different hydrothermal vent fields is that they are predominantly around the tectonic plate regions. Now that's not necessarily the only location that they are found. You can definitely see ones that are in the middle of the plate, but it's important to note that at least for hydrothermal activity as we currently uh, consider it, it requires the heat of you know, mantle rock uh, out venting different hydrothermal fluids. And I've just described that there's this ecological community that's living around the hydrothermal vents. So what would abiotic chemistry even look like there? What abiotic chemistry could be happening? It's been a question that people have been trying to pursue for uh, quite some time. This is not an exhaustive list of studies, but the work of McCollum and Seewald and Jill McDermott and Chris German looking at these different kind of abiotic chemistries that might exist at hydrothermal vents usually relies very heavily on carbon isotope uh, distributions, seeing that car lighter carbon isotopes being more indicative for life. Now on the left, you'll see here that there's also support for uh, the abiotic sort of synthes syntheses that can exist in deep sea hydrothermal environments in terms of energetics. The plot ends up uh, having the axis on the x-axis is temperature and on the y-axis is log fugacity of uh, H2. So you're talking about the ability for it to be more reduced. And there's a region for temperature and reduction considered in this plot where abiotic organic synthesis would be thermodynamically favorable. 
Additionally, in the McDermott paper from 2015, uh, where she goes in to ex explain the different kinds of organic compounds that are being detected at these hydrothermal vents, I've highlighted that arguments for an abiotic origin of organic compounds in deep sea hot springs are compelling because of their potential role in the origin of life and sustaining microbial communities. So here we see another indication that the mixing history of an abiotic reaction is not so simple as the abiotic being separate from life. In fact, life is, is very likely, uh, uh, it's very likely resulting in a consumption of these abiotic compounds if they are life compatible. Abiotic chemistry is also currently at the fore in terms of uh, NASA initiatives. So this is the astrobiology strategy as you can find on the NASA website. And the astrobiology strategy after sum, uh, summarizing the concerns and interests of the general scientific community in astrobiology you see at the top of the list is identifying abiotic sources of organic compounds. So what I propose to you today is that to differentiate the signs of life, you must first understand what is possible without life. Because abiotic chemistry is so uh, intrinsically linked with biology, we need to pursue that through abiotic experimental means. Some of my work uh, to date, which is going to be expanding as my group expands, is to map these different chemical pathways with different kinds of minerals. And I'll tell you the story of magnetite specifically. So why do we need abiotic pathway maps at all, especially for things such as organic and mineral reactions? Well, we learned some of our lessons in terms of looking at objects that exist outside of our own planet by looking back at Earth and trying to figure out uh, how to decon uh, deconvolute the abiotic from the biotic. The Earth so far is our only data point that contains life uh, for certain, and it happens to be made of rock. The rock record itself is a little bit confusing because rock can be influenced by organisms. In fact, in the paper I've highlighted here by Hazen and Morrison in 2022, they proposed that 30% of minerals on Earth form solely through biological uh, or biologically influenced mechanisms. And as much as 50% uh, of minerals can form through biological pathways. We also see an interaction between minerals and organics in biology itself. Here you can see shelled organ, uh, organisms and creatures they often involve uh, mineral precipitation of aragonite and calcite. There's microorganisms such as diatoms that have silica sort of uh, locations in their outer membranes. And then there's the kinds of mineralogy that is found within humans. Additionally, we see examples on earth of abiotic degradation and maturation of deposits left behind by biology. And initially my thoughts would go to our fuel deposits such as oil fields and coal. In these examples, you end up having abiotic reactions because of heat and diagenesis resulting in new organic compounds that are abiotic. Abiotic chemistry is also dilute with biology. I've already given the example of hydrothermal vents, but let's also consider about terrestrial hot springs. So there's lots of environments on our planet specifically that are hydrothermal and hydrothermal just meaning that they contain hot water and the water temperature can vary depending on the environment. If we think about hot springs and geysers uh, on earth, volcanism can result in hydrothermal venting. Like we see in Yellowstone National Park, which I was able to vis visit during my graduate degree and Iceland, which is where I met Wolf. In both of these environments, you have microbial communities also living within these hot environments as extremophilic. So it's very difficult to figure out exactly what's happening in a purely abiotic sense, even though we have some of the uh, mixings for different kinds of abiotic reactions. Additionally, for hydrothermal vents, um, they've become sort of an interesting 
location, a hot topic, if you will, for different kinds of icy moons. And that's specifically because we see on Earth different kinds of black smokers, white smokers, and a mixed variety of other types of hydrothermal vents. But they are the results of different kinds of processes, and they result in different kinds of chemistries. So on Enceladus, we're more likely to have it be a water rock related environment than something that's strictly tectonic. There's also abiotic locations in the solar system where we see organic compounds in the presence of different min uh, minerals. And that includes asteroids, where we get examples of such bodies through you know, meteorites such as Murchison, which is pictured here. We've got comets, which have small volatile organic compounds and some rocky components as well as ice, and maybe icy moons. But that's the big question. Are icy moons capable of biological activity activity or are they more abiotic? And something that's quite important to me is to make the distinction that not all abiotic processes must necessarily be considered to be prebiotic to be relevant to astrobiology. We need to know exactly what exists before biology or in the absence of biology so that we can try and uh, differentiate biosignatures that we find in the future. So for my next point, I'll digress. When I lived in Tokyo, Japan, something that seemed quite incredible was the fact that it was such a populous location. You've got a population of 13 million people. You've got three of the busiest train stations in the world, uh, moving people to and fro every day. And because of that, particular moving of individuals, you have one of the most comprehensive train systems in the world. This is just one of the different train maps that is available. This is the JR East Group. Uh, and you can see that it's very neatly outlined for different locations and stations that you could go to on this particular line. Um, and it serves actually as a very useful framework for mapping out complexity and how things interact with one another. Pathway mapping is not something that's new. In fact, biochemists have already been thinking in pathway maps for quite some time. Here, these are different metabolic pathways uh, drawn so that, that you can see exactly where different metabolites interact with one another. So let's zoom in on specifically the uh, citric acid cycle location. So here you have these different metabolites in a very complex system interrelating uh, between these other met metabolic cycles and uh, transitions in between. And it looks very similar to a Tokyo Metro. In fact, in the middle of the JR East group, you see there's uh, this circle and it's called the Yamanote line. It's considered sort of the heartbeat of how this particular a series of train paths moves because it's able to move people from one particular type of uh, part of the map to the other in a cyclic fashion in either direction, similar to how uh, TCA works. Now, the big question, and something that I'm probably going to spend a career trying to figure out, is can we do the same sort of thing for abiotic reactions? And there's been different approaches in trying to sort through the organic chemistry that's available on Earth. One of the first I'll bring up to your attention is this series of workshops and discussions that was called Earth and Five Reactions, which was uh, one of the different projects that was uh, encouraged and facilitated by the Deep Carbon Observatory grant. Now, in the Earth and Five Reactions framework, you see that there were certain types of reactions highlighted that are either organic or mineral related. And it is itself an ambitious concept, which resulted in the evaluation and summary of important chemical classifications occurring on Earth. And when they refer to these types of reactions as important, we didn't just talk about the biological. We also included abiotic examples for these different reactions. And in fact, if you're interested, there was a series of papers that resulted on each of these topics in American Mineralogist in uh, 2020. And I would happen to be a co-author on two such topics, hydrogenation and carboxylation, decarboxylation. So it's 
for me, something that helps us to go after the types of chemistry that Earth allows. Additionally, there was this paper from uh, 2019, which was part of a larger book uh, summarizing research from the Deep Carbon Observatory called Deep Carbon Past to Present. And chapter 14 was called Earth as Organic Chemist. And in my opinion happens to be a very good first step in the direction that we need, where it outlined the different kinds of organic chemical reaction pathways resulting from hydrothermal experiments of aromatic compounds. In this chapter, there's a couple different charts that show the different reactions, but this is a reimagined diagram of reactions without minerals as I've drawn it. And here you can see that there are different compounds that sort of share central locations, different reactions that are considered to be reversible, ones that happen to terminate in one particular uh, product. And it's a large messy map. But if you take that particular map, just for organic compounds in this case without any minerals present, and you simplify it down to the organic train station view, you now have a helpful framework for people who are not necessarily trained in organic chemistry to start discussing different kinds of parameters that will either result in different uh, formations of organic compounds or processes. So then you can start to ask questions like, where do different paths overlap? Under what conditions do certain organic paths become available? And what areas on this map need to be experimentally tested? Here you can see in green on the right, I've got thermodynamic prediction as one way to sort of consider how you connect one node of this particular pathway to another. So my overall goal in my research is to map available organic chemistry for a realistic geologic context through experiments. And speaking of a geologic context, we'll start with the serpentinization reaction. Serpentinization is incredibly ubiquitous water rock reaction It exists in objects all throughout our solar system. On earth, it exists in continental environments such as Oman, it exists in submarine environments such as Lost City, uh, hydrothermal vent, and it exists in the matrices of meteorites that we've collected from different kinds of asteroids. And the water rock reaction is essentially ultramafic rocks reacting with water results in serpentinization. And the reaction that I'm writing here is uh, grossly oversimplified, but you can start with any number of different ultramafic rocks plus water. And if your starting material contains iron, then you'll end up with a uh, different kind of serpentine minerals, something that is a, a metal hydroxide such as brucite and magnetite. And the experiments I've pursued so far sort of start with magnetite as the beginning material. So let's begin the experiments. So far to date, I've performed experiments with magnetite with powder, with thin film, and with natural crystals. And I've coupled that particular mineral with the exploration of reactions for carboxylic acids. Today, I'll go through three specific carboxylic acids I've pursued, even though there are papers that are currently being written with other organic compounds. Carboxylic acids are an appealing starting material because they happen to have biological and abiotic uh, relevance. You can see in fatty acids and different cell membranes, there's carboxylic acids. Aromatic carboxylic acids exist in meteorites. Uh, amino acids, which are uh, important for biology, are also a main component inside meteorites. And from the Martin's 2011 paper, we know that there is uh, which summarized a lot of different studies on meteorites. There is at least uh, 300 monocarboxylic acids in the Murchison meteorite alone. So carboxylic acids are incredibly relevant. So when I perform experiments, my starting materials are very simple. I start with one organic compound, mineral powder, and water. And through an ex a hydrothermal experimental process, which starts with filling a gold capsule with the mineral, the organic, and water, sealing it shut and then placing it into a cold seal vessel. I can then heat that reaction mixture to 300 degrees Celsius and one kilobar, perform the reaction, which in this case ends up inflating the capsule because of the generation of CO2, uh, 
extract that capsule with organic solvent, and then analyze that extracted organic mixture by gas chromatography or another analytical technique to result in data. So for the organic compound phenyl acetic acid, one of the major pathways that was observed was decarboxylation, the formation of toluene and the generation of CO2. Uh, this is from uh, a study in, uh, published in 2010 by Chris Klein. Here you'll see on the x-axis for both of these plots is time and on the y-axis is mole percent. What you're essentially seeing is that for phenyl acetic acid, as it is being consumed, um, it is generating the decarboxylation product toluene in an experiment where no mineral is present. When magnetite is added, these curves change. So now you see there is a greater loss of phenyl acetic acid in this particular set of experiments with magnetite, but that does not track in an increase in the decarboxylation product. In fact, the decarboxylation product is diminished. The explanation for that is that magnetite then activates additional product pathways. In this case, there ends up being dibenzyl ketone and transtilene. So in the Glein experiments, uh, the only product that is yielded is the decarboxylation product, and the generation of CO2. When magnetite is added to the mixture, this reaction still proceeds, but now there is also the incorporation of a ketone, dibenzyl ketone in this case. Once dibenzyl ketone exists, there ends up being these additional product pathways that can be generated in secondary products. In the early days of hydrothermal uh, experimental literature, the expectation in hydrothermal condi conditions was that you couldn't make bonds, you could only break bonds. But what I've observed and what other people observed under hydrothermal conditions is that you can actually make bonds and this seems to be more abundant in the presence of different kinds of minerals. Let's talk about a little bit of the thermodynamics of why that might happen. So these are reactions that were observed in hydrothermal hot water, decarboxylation and the ketone formation. And through thermodynamic modeling using uh, the Schnazar package, I generated these curves. On the x-axis is temperature in degrees C and on the y-axis is log K. Here I've written that K, which is the equilibrium constant is equal to products over reactants. And for a K value that's greater than one, which means that the log K value is gonna be greater than zero, that means that the reaction is um, more favorably going towards the products. So in this particular uh, example at one kilobar, you'll see that decarboxylation here modeled as acetic acid going to methane and CO2 is much more favorable than ketone formation which is two equivalents of acetic acid going to acetone, CO2, and water. But there appears to be a temperature dependence. And so in fact, ketone formation should be available above a threshold of 220 degrees C. Some asides on thermodynamics uh, is that at higher temperatures, the T term of delta uh, G equals uh, delta H minus T delta S ends up being important for values where your entropy is going to be greater than zero, which means that reactions that are considered unfavorable at low temperatures now have the energy available to proceed. Water properties also change. So water, as we as written here um, in autoprotolysis, the generation of a proton and hydroxide ions, heat can actually be considered by Le Chatelier's principle to be a reactant. And so therefore, will drive the direction of the reaction towards products. The change in the solution phase of water then means that the dielectric constant of water becomes more like an organic solvent. It can dissolve things that are less polar. And so organic compounds then become much more easily dissolved in water, resulting in reactions that you may not otherwise see at room temperature. So I've just described the particular reaction and, and rationale for why different ketones are forming in the presence of magnetite, but does the same reaction occur on different minerals? One thing I'm going after is universality. So in my experiments, I performed uh, 
additional complementary experiments with minerals that had properties that were similar and different from magnetite itself. So here, uh, spinel and magnetite had similar structures. Corundum and hematite had similar structures. Magnetite and hematite had similar elements. Spinel and corundum had similar elements. And keeping in mind that for each one of these minerals, there are actually a lot of things that cannot be held constant. For example, surface properties and electrochemical properties will vary for each one of these particular materials. So this was the reaction scheme I've drawn so far for magnetite. And ketone formation was observed in the case of all four of these minerals. But there seemed to be some uh, comparison that could be done for the crystal shape and therefore the availability of the different surface uh, sites, resulting in a higher ketone yield in the spinel examples versus a lower ketone yield in the corundum and hematite examples. And one of the things I propose is that spinel and magnetite, in fact, provide a more favorable bond distance for the intermediate. What you're seeing here in a three-dimensional space is the surface of a spinel, magnesium aluminum spinel mineral, and the binding of two phenyl acetic acids such that they can form a carbon bond between the two molecules. So the ketonic decarboxylation mechanism actually involves uh, a few different steps, including the formation of an intermediate, which results from the loss of a proton to form an enol. Now, once that enol is formed, that means that you now have the avail availability to create a bond between these two organic molecules. To test that mechanism for organic, uh, other organic compounds, you can actually turn off the availability of that proton. So in this case, um, I've added two methyl groups to the structure of the phenyl acetic acid. The resulting structures, when they are bound, there is no way for there to be a proton lost, no H bond to lose, no enol to form, and as a result, no ketone. I tested this experimentally and that was exactly what I observed. The ketone formation pathway was completely shut off. Now I explained the formation of ketones and the secondary product transtilbene, but there are more than simply ketones that are formed in the presence of magnetite. In fact, there is the generation of these other additional reaction products, benzoic acid, deoxybenzoin, and benzene. And as you can tell sort of by the curves, the relationship is not just as simple as one, as all of them building up over time. Some end up being used as reactants. And so when I'm generating these uh, reaction pathway maps, the new formation of benzoic acid only existed in the magnetite and the hematite, the iron containing experiments. Once benzoic acid exists, it can go through a decarboxylation. Additionally, it can react with the starting material and form a ketone because it is not inhibited. Uh, it has the ability to make an enol. So then that's sort of a proof of chemical universality. And once that ketone exists, it now can result in additional product paths going in other directions. This is another way to think about that particular type of reaction. Here I've drawn it so that you can see simultaneous reactions and reaction intermediates occurring uh, along a theoretical mineral surface at the same time as reactions are occurring in the water by itself. So certain types of reactions will require either a mineral surface, the ability to conduct electrons, and other reactions can exist in water without any mineral surface at all. So now looking at another example of uh, chemical universality, we'll look at the compound hydrosynamic acid. Hy hydrosynamic acid differs from phenyl acetic acid in the addition of uh, a CH2 in its structure. Now, if it were to proceed by decarboxylation, it would create this ethylbenzene as well as CO2. That's not what we observe. Something to note is that in the phenyl acetic acid experiments, the reaction was completed at around 70 hours. You'll see on the x-axis I have time and on the y-axis I have mole percent. 70 hours is around my first time point. This is a much slower reaction. And without any mineral present, hydrosynamic acid 
does react a little bit, but it is certainly not accounting for an amount of ethyl benzene that would be the decarboxylation product. That changes when you add magnetite. So in this case, you end up uh, consuming more hydrodynamic acid in the presence of magnetite, and there is a generation of ethyl benzene. Additionally, there ends up being a product path that is not observed uh, in the presence of mineral, but only seen whenever there was no mineral present. And this is a cyclization product. Magnetite assisted products included a widespread of different kinds of reaction uh, analytes. These are the most prominent from a mixture of different peaks seen in chromatography. And there's a little bit of universality observed for ketone products, which now are available to uh, act as reactants. So in generating a uh, reaction map for this type of reaction, I first start by noting that there is a new pathway that comes from hydrodynamic acid and results in the cyclization. This is not seen with the minerals, so it's something that seems to exist in the water alone as long as there are no competitive paths uh, occur. There's the formation of the symmetrical ketone, which then goes off to form other uh, conjugated ring structures. There's universality of reaction paths from what we saw in phenylacetic acid. There is the generation of a shorter chain carboxylic acid, as well as some uh, asymmetrical ketone generation. And so some of these particular universal reaction paths seem to be maintained. Now, if I look at a compound such as benzoic acid, partly for uh, creation of the first reaction path, but also to see about ketone formation, you'll note that benzoic acid does not have available to it the same kind of uh, wealth of reaction paths that seems to be available in the case of phenylacetic acid and hydrodynamic acid. Again, on the x-axis is time in hours, and on the y-axis is mole percent. For hydrodynamic acid, in the case of either containing mineral or not containing mineral, in this case, magnetite, it proceeds the same way. The decarboxylation path is the primary path and it accounts for 100% of the generation of the product yield. There's no ketone formation and that is actually completely in line with the hypothetical mechanism because there is no availability of an enol intermediate. You cannot lose a hydrogen bond. Benzoic acid itself is also very interesting because from the phenylacetic acid starting material, you need to look at, at the mechanism of its formation. And one thing that led me in the directions my research has pro, uh, proceeded more recently is the question, is this an electron transfer reaction? And part of that was inspired by the work of Ziming Yang, who used copper in a, a geomimicry setting to pursue the oxidation reaction of phenylacetic acid and benzoic acid. In his experiments, he used copper to uh, accept an electron from the organic structures, therefore being oxidized and settled out of, re of the reaction mixture. The diagram of reactions and intermediates that he has drawn here can also be considered like an electrochemical reaction. Instead of the copper being oxidized, just draw the reaction so that it is the transfer of specific electrons. And then you can choose at different experiments to start at various intermediate steps, in this case, an alcohol or the aldehyde to see if you can generate the carboxylic acids. This question is one of the drivers that resulted in my uh, time spent in Tokyo, Japan at the Earth Life Science Institute and the generation of different electrochemical experiments. Here's just a list of some of the uh, wonderful colleagues and collaborators that I gained through that project. Electrochemistry is in fact uh, coming to the fore more recently in geologic environments. Here is a paper from 2018 um, from Andrew Steely. In this experiment dealing with electrochemical reduction of CO2 on the Martian surface, he proposes that a layer of organic material that is, exists on uh, lamellar titanium containing magnetite grains was a result of electrochemical corrosion and that this process is in fact potentially abiotic. 
Additionally, uh, Ryuhei Nakamura has been interested in looking at the natural electrical current that is generated at hydrothermal vents, which can result in either abiotic reactions or coupling with biology. In this case, uh, the electron gradient that is generated can actually be used by microorganisms at the hydrothermal vents to help them metabolize CO2. Um, in that generation of electrons, you actually have a reductive zone within the hydrothermal vent, and you've got the more uh, oxidative zone in the seawater resulting in that gradient. It's actually been detected that this results in a charge uh, at a hydrothermal vent environment. Additionally, geoelectrochemistry driven alteration of amino acids was something that was pursued by Dr. Yami Lee, and I had the uh, great pleasure of being a co author on this paper where she was looking at the different kinds of degradation of amino acids into organic compounds that we see today in the meteorite record, assuming that this may be a result of uh, electrochemical processes that could exist in the overall parent body. So electrochemistry itself is a tool to track and control the flow of electrons, to probe reactions that are difficult to probe at high temperatures, in my case, and to test the robustness of electrocatalysts at different conditions. In general setup, setup of an electrochemical cell can vary depending on what you want to do, but this is just an example of an H-type electrochemical reactor that I used while I was at LC. Uh, there I pursued experiments that uh, here, this was a magnetite thin film on a titanium plate. I also made working electrodes made from natural um, mineral magnetites, which were ultrasonically soldered to copper wire here just showing where the location of a counter electrode and reference electrode is in an electrochemical setup. Additionally, there ends up being a choice of solution that you would like to make. My solution often contains some organic compound and electrolytes such as uh, KOH to sort of uh, pursue the pH environment that you might see in an omonophyllite. And then uh, anoxic conditions such as uh, argon or nitrogen atmosphere. And today I won't necessarily talk about some of the results from those experiments. I'm in the process of trying to write those up, but uh, in my laboratory at RPI, I'm currently uh, growing out those particular facilities, having or uh, graduate students and undergraduates who will be working on those experiments and so results will be coming soon. Additionally, uh, because today my focus was more on published results, there's going to be more hydrothermal experiments to come. I'm building a new hydrothermal lab at RPI. And so uh, be pursuing a lot of different temperature and parameter space, combining that with electrochemistry and seeing what, how that influences different reaction paths. So stay tuned, see what's coming on the horizon and know that for this type of experimental mapping, I'm very open to collaboration and growth in this area of research. To go back to our uncle Sam, we want you to help look at this parameter space and help explore. There's too much in any sort of cartography of organic reactions for one person to do alone. So collaboration will be key if we want to move forward. Okay, here's the shameless plug that I promised at the beginning. The uh, Rensselaer Astrobiology Research and Education Center is a newly forming astrobiology center in Troy, New York. Uh, it is funded by the Earth First Origins Project, which is a NASA grant. Uh, which involved collaborators from across the country. Here I've listed the four main PIs. And uh, for the 2023-2024 year, we are currently uh, trying to recruit more postdoctoral researchers, instrumentation specialists, graduate students, which will be on a yearly basis recruiting. And if you would like to learn how to get involved, how to collaborate, or anything else, I've placed my RPI email here. So please feel free to reach out. So it was a great pleasure for me to uh, speak to you today. And of course, thank you very much. And let me know if you have any questions. Thanks. Also, um, Christine, it was very nice to hear your talk. And now you can just, if you want to arise a question, just please raise your hands and I will then give you the, give you the word immediately. Yeah, so there is actually a question 
uh, via the chat, which I'm read out, uh, from Pedro Mustedes. Um, my question is, um, my question is whether the size of the mineral particles can influence to favor this type of reactions. Thank you very much for that question. Uh, that's actually, so in terms of particle size, there's usually a threshold, at least considered so far, which is that if the particles themselves are not down to the nanoscale so that you end up having sort of distorted crystal structure, um, then you would assume that surface area, so particle size, would just result in the increase of certain reaction rates, but not necessarily changes in the reaction paths. If instead you talk about things where the unit cell is actually disrupted, uh, very small nanoparticles, now you have a different kind of reaction path that might be available. So those type of reactions, a lot of times people are using uh, materials where there are disordered edges or amorphous materials. And I um, usually when looking at amorphous results, they would be very different from kinds of uh, reactions that would exist with specifically mineral formulas. I would actually have a follow-up question on that. Namely, I mean, what can be said something about the porosity of, uh, of these catalysts? Because I mean, some catalysts which are produced maybe, maybe by volcanic process where a lot of gases are involved, some minerals might be very porous and they might actually offer quite a lot of surface com uh, compared to their size. Has there been some investigation on that how porosity of the catalysts will affect the catalyst efficiency. Yeah, that's actually, so there's, um, actually I'm very interested in terms of catalyst porosity as well. There's a, so a researcher who is working with Ryuhei Nakamura who is looking at um, at least the material coming from the hydrothermal vent, which is very porous by nature because of the deposition environment. Yeah. And um, I know that at least with the research from Jill McDermott, I think a more recent paper has dealt with their proposition is that certain types of organic reactions exist primarily because they are happening within the pore. And so there is a less uh, steric hindrance from a more dilute solution in that case because there's a concentrating effect. And so I think that, that right now to, to answer the main question, there is definitely interest currently in trying to map out the kind of porosity influence and whether or not, it, in my mind, whether or not, you know, micropore, mesopore, or macropore structure is better for certain types of reactions. I know that at least in electrochemical catalysis, my graduate student had mentioned that there's some research occurring in uh, mesopore materials because it seems to be more catalytic than something that's just small pores versus large pores, but the mix is what's very important. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. There is another question via the chat, which is, um, I have a question about the ratio of uh, carboxylic acids towards Fe3O4. So, Yuan Yan, please could you tell us what actually your question is exactly about the ratio of carboxylic acids via Fe3O4? Can you hear me? Yes, you're very soft, but yes. Uh, I actually have a question about the concentration of the capsule acid you use in your experiments. Uh, the yes, compare the, yes. Yeah, I think I understand. So the in this experiment, the initial concentration used was one molar, which is quite large, of course. But that was because it was trying to map the pathway initially because the capsule of the experiment is um, very small. And so to see the uh, amount of organic structure, the carboxylic acid had to be quite large. Mm -hmm. um, the ratio, I haven't done the 
I had the calculation before. Okay. It, uh, because yes. I had, uh, you know, it was a certain number of organic compounds per surface area, and it was overwhelming for sure. So there should be a predominance towards the water uh, reaction. Okay. So I just wonder if, uh, because uh, for the magnetite, they have their surface area. So if the organic, like the carbonic acid, they uh, center the surface of magnetite. Yeah, that is a concern. I know that there was, um, at least in the case of the hydrostatic acid experiments, mm -hmm. it appeared that the some, sometimes the hydrostatic acid would bind to the magnetite, which would result mm -hmm. in um, a need to acidify the solution mm -hmm. during the um, extraction phase. So that is one possible reason that that reaction is perhaps slower um, okay. because it could be poisoning the surface. Mm -hmm. In the case of phenylacetic acid, at least didn't appear to be such an issue, but that's one way to go after that would be to control the pH, which is something that's always been um, on my list of to do's. Uh, so yeah, that's a, thank you for your question. There's definitely more to pursue in terms of the actual surface saturation. And I think that that would require a collaboration with a surface scientist to observe at the higher temperature, the binding potential. Okay, great, thank you. Another question via the um, via the chat: uh, uh, Is there a plausible mechanism for the formation of carboxylic acids in hydrothermal vents? I believe that the current thought, but it hasn't been. It needs to be pursued further. Is that for carboxylic acids in hydrothermal vents, it might be the generation of. Um, the reaction of CO2 with uh, H2 in, through Fischer-Tropsch reactions. I know that that's something that's been proposed is that the Fischer-Tropsch would be quite uh, important in these environments. Uh, personally, I'm quite interested in that as well because of uh, when you're looking at different kinds of organic compounds generated from CO2, uh, that would be very important for sustainability in green chemistry. So uh, to fully answer that question, I think so far the idea is a fischer tropsch reaction, but it isn't completely known. Right, there is a question by Donald Penn. Donald, please go ahead. Hey, uh, very nice talk. Uh, I'm not sure if this question is uh, was appropriate for your talk, but uh, I was just uh, very curious. Uh, do, do you think uh, machine learning right now is sophisticated enough to play a role in exploring all that uh, chemical reaction pathway space? Yeah, that's it's an interesting question because that's, that's sort of the direction that everything that's data-driven is, is headed. Um, I think so far, my opinions on machine learning for this type of experimental setup is that we don't yet have the sufficient experimental database to train AI to solve some of these problems. So we have to do more experimental studies before it can uh, help us sort of map out that space. Um, and that's, and that's something I just has, and part of it is that disconnect between abiotic chemistry versus prebiotic chemistry, because we've got a lot of information so far with the generation of what's referred to as the prebiotic molecules, but we haven't really spent time going through the abiotic pathways. So when training in AI for machine learning, I don't think we'd yet have um, what's needed to move forward with that. Oh, so your job is safe. Thanks. <laughs> now there is another question via the chat. I wonder if you have a look at the impact of your organics 
on the mineral itself in terms of morphology after the experiments or else? Have you worked with other minerals than magnetite? Yeah, I, so there was actually, there was a, a little bit of a, um, when I was finishing my time at ASU, there was another graduate student who was working with uh, uh, zinc sulfide, which was in that case, it was, um, I'm trying to remember the exact form, but it was one of one particular morphology. And I was curious about the organic compounds, whether or not they were being uh, altering the minerals, because there was another researcher who was thinking about specifically for sulfide minerals, how it could be changed at hydrothermal conditions with the addition of organics. And so um, that was a, a professor, Andrew Ch uh, Ch Chismeshia, and he'd done some theoretical uh, calculation showing that there was a well that formed that was about the size of the organic compound used. And so I ran SEM imaging and, and I, I did a lot of SEM imaging before and after reactions. And at least for the oxides, it didn't appear to have an impact. For sulfide minerals, it changes the morphology completely, at least for a couple of the ones that I've tried. Um, so I think it depends very much on the solubility of the specific uh, minerals that are at play. And for metal oxides, at least, it, at least the ones I've gone after, they're very stable at hydrothermal conditions and even the incorporation of the organic compounds isn't necessarily going to change the structure, um, but sulfides for sure. I think sulfides definitely have a binding and will be altered after reaction.